Thank you. My name is Pierre Falavier. I'm with the United Nations Resident Coordinator's Office covering Mauritius and Seychelles, and I'm uh, based in Port Louis. Um, we have uh, with our colleague from uh, the World Bank and the International Economics uh, since June last year been running webinars uh, to promote research on different components related to the COVID crisis, uh, first to assess its impact um, and directions for recovery. Today our webinar will be discussing the current situation of uh, the vaccination and also um, um, the opening of borders. We started last year uh, largely discussion, discussing about Mauritius. This year we're going to expand to other island states in the region and we are very glad today uh, to have our guests uh, from Seychelles. Uh, so we will start today uh, with a presentation uh, by uh, Dr. Musango, uh, uh, the representative for the World Health Organization uh, for Mauritius, who is both a medical doctor a researcher and a practitioner in public health with a very long experience in the region uh, and who has provided a lot of the guidance to the government over the last year on the preparedness and response to COVID. Uh, we will then um, have a presentation uh, by Mr. Ali Mansour, who is the chairman of the Regional Multidisciplinary Center of Excellence uh, that promotes reform in Africa through peer learning and peer support. He has a very long experience uh, at uh, both with the government, with the financial um, secretary in Mauritius, with the IMF and with the World Bank in Mauritius and the region. After him, we have uh, Mrs. Alice Twizé from Comesa, who is a senior trade officer at, at Comesa and has an extensive experience of more than 15 years in trade policy and strategy formulation and implementation. Finally, uh, we will We'll have Ms. Erin Francis, who is the CEO of um, the Seychelles Tourism, uh, Tourism Board and will soon be the, the Principal Secretary of the Tourism Department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Tourism for Seychelles. So, without further ado, um, Dr. Musango, if you are ready, we'd be glad to, to have you. We are starting with presentations and then uh, we will have a plenary session of discussion that will be moderated by Eric from the World Bank. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to, to speak on this uh, important uh, topic, which is really uh, important at that moment of uh, period of COVID-19 and uh, the time that you are facing on the second wave in Mauritius. And of course, we cannot say that is uh, the last one because, uh, you know, it's a, a pandemic that surprised the world. So no one was prepared. Uh, poor country, rich country, big country. So everyone was surprised and uh, we are still uh, learning by doing. So this is showing uh, the, the, the global situation, the global situation in the world. And uh, I, I am sure that it's just to remind you, but globally uh, on 16 May, so a few days ago, ago, you can see the number, uh, the number of uh, 162 million of confirmed cases including uh, 3 million and 300 deaths. This is uh, really like uh, uh, three times the population of Mauritius died due to uh, COVID. And uh, 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 in WHO we used to compare uh, the, 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 the weeks, the weeks to see the performance how it's going on. And uh, over the 4.8 uh, million new cases were, were reported last week. And we can see a decrease of 19.2% from the previous week. So compare uh, the, 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 this week to the previous week. So I'm, I'm talking about last week to the previous week. And the uh, week case increased only in West Pacific region 
and in the African region. So as uh, uh, COVID-19 is decreasing in other region, but in Africa, you can see it is increasing and it, 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 it increased to 2% uh, compare the last, two, uh, the last two weeks. So now, as you are talking about vaccine, and this is really very important to talk on vaccine, for the number of vaccine distributed uh, in, in Africa, you, you will see that uh, only 1.7% uh, of the vaccine distributed compared to the what? Uh, those administrated for uh, 400 people. Those administrated for 100 people is 1.7 percent in Africa compared to almost 20 in the rest of the globe. So you can see how Africa is really behind other. Uh, com if you, you compare, we compare this to uh, that uh, figures. So it's 10 times less compare the global situation to the African situation. Now, uh, moving on uh, the vaccine distributed, uh, the percentage of those received that were administrated, uh, in Africa, the those who received almost 62% uh, of the vaccine given to the African region were administrated to the population. Now, this is the Dutch board that we are using. I don't know if you can see very well the screen, but uh, uh, this is showing the Dutch board that, that uh, Africa region is using to know how countries are making progress. So if you can open, for example, this link to know how many countries received the vaccine, how much they used, the percentage of used, all information are on this screen that you are distributing in the uh, African region. And uh, this is the ratio of vaccine received uh, per 100 people. Uh, and uh, you can see that Mauritius, uh, I'm trying to have my screen, I cannot read very well. Sorry for that. Uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can, quite clearly. So we can see 22, uh, 22 uh, person per, per 100 person. Yeah, yeah for the, exactly, for, for Mauritius, Mauritius, for Mauritius and 71 for Seychelles. So you will see uh, Mauritius and Seychelles are the most uh, first country with the vaccine, with the people uh, receive, receive the vaccine, so vaccinated. And uh, the indicator considered the two doses required per person. And seven countries that have not received vaccine, well, this is a few weeks ago, but I think it's still the same situation in Burkina Faso, Burundi, Central Africa, Chad, Eritrea, Madagascar, and Tanzania. Even if they received it uh, maybe last week before uh, uh, collecting those information. Now, in terms of uh, ratio of administration, uh, you, the difference of the, the previous, this slide and that one, the first one, it was the vaccine received, but this one is the vaccine uh, administrated now per uh, percentage of the population. You, you know, in Mauritius, the policy that you have is to keep two doses for uh, everyone. Instead of giving uh, all doses and be in shortage and not being able to, uh, to, to provide the second dose to the population. So when you are receiving, for example, uh, 100,000, we are accounting 50 to be vaccinated, 50,000 uh, to be vaccinated. When you are receiving 200, we are accounting 100. So we are keeping two doses 
for each one at least to, to, to guarantee the second dose for everyone vaccinated. The reason why the, the those administrated is around 80% of the total population. So now uh, the problem really where it is uh, coming to the opening of the border now is the deployment of the vaccine. So of course the good news is that uh, since 4th February when deployment started, more people have been vaccinated against COVID-19 compared to, to the people confirmed to have been affected uh, to COVID-19 since the beginning of the epidemic. So this is a good news. At least the number of people vaccinated now is bigger than the people uh, affected. But, but, and this is the problem, the big one, 60% of all vaccine doses have been administrated in just 10 countries. Just 10 countries. Well, don't me ask which are the 10 countries. You must imagine them yourself. Uh, <laughs> it's not complicated to know them. Those are the big country and the rich country and those countries that are producing the vaccine. And in Africa, only 0.2% of all vaccine doses have been administrated in the Africa. So really, it's not even 1%. And you know, uh, you are economist and what? And in terms of population, 70% of the population are living in Africa. 70%, one seven, one seven are living in Africa, but only 0.2% of all, all vaccines uh, those have been administrated in Africa. Now, uh, coming to Mauritius itself, the number, the exact number, number of persons vaccinated from uh, 26 January is the that date we started until yesterday when I was uh, pre prepare, preparing this uh, presentation. We have a, a total number of persons vaccinated, 223 percent, uh, and uh, 223,737 for the first dose. This this is vaccination vaccinated for the first dose. So the number of 8% I provide to I provided to you. Those who received already the two doses is 100 uh, 101 uh, 113 uh, 100 southern. Uh, so this is the number of people who received uh, the two consecutive doses. So what I want to say here, we cannot uh, think about open, opening the border because, uh, because the disease don't have the border. The, the, the disease will still traveling. The disease will come from the north to the south and the, 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 from east to west, everywhere the disease don't have the border. Uh, in the situation where only 0.2% of the all vaccines are only uh, received in the African region, uh, the, the, the disease can move again from Africa to the north, even they are fully vaccinated, unless the border continue to be closed. And uh, uh, to solve that, what the key message you have seen in WHO is the equitable situation, at least ensuring equitable access to vaccine, uh, which require extraordinary measure and global collaboration. If the country are not collaborating for sharing doses, for making a campaign engagement, for allowing free export on critical materials for vaccine manufacturing, and even <laughs> going beyond by sharing the technology and manufacturing uh, within the country. This, if it's not done, you know that will be still a challenge for uh, the decision of uh, opening the border. The second issue is the vaccine effort in undermining hard, uh, hard warm game. Uh, future, we, in the future we must continue to wear masks, physical distancing, and avoid crowds. Because people are thinking that, and you have seen uh, the US declare that, if you are uh, vaccinated, you can remove your mask. Well, you, 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 you cannot for the moment 
what is suggested and that will be uh, my conclusion where WHO is, is, is saying do it all because if you are vaccinated but others are not yet vaccinated continue to, to, to use other existing measures and the vaccine pro, pro production is the, the vaccine production in the hands of the few as I said you have seen only uh, uh, only uh, 10 countries have 72% of the vaccine. So few countries are still keeping the vaccine. So distribution is not really large in the pharmaceutical com com company and the few firm for which they grant licenses, they are still continue to keep it themselves. And uh, supply cannot match the demand. So in French, we used to say la loi de l'offre la demand. If the demand is very high than the offer, that is still keeping a problem. And the development of COVID-19 COVID vaccine has been astonishingly quick. Supply cannot uh, match with uh, demand so far, but I think I will show you some solution that I go, I go, are going on. And uh, we are still, we have also to keep ensuring the quality, safety and efficiency of the vaccine in the organization because the health the, 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 should be the priority. Those vaccines should respect the norms and standard and being sure that all companies that are producing vaccine are producing the vaccine with quality, safety and efficiency. So now there is also a problem of uh, uh, vaccine hesitancy uh, in some countries where they are rolling out uh, the vaccine. And this is due to rumors and people who are influencing others. And this also must be taken, taken into account. The last but not least is the rapid scale up of manufacturing capacity and cooperation, which is really needed to avoid this inequity. And uh, you have seen that the license uh, has been uh, uh, removed by some country. This is under discussion and we hope that will, this will help at least to scale up and uh, to, 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 to at least to, have, to, to allow country like South Africa, India, you know, South Africa, let me jump on HIV. South Africa is the, is the country that saved the African region for producing the HIV vaccine. Otherwise, if you are waiting for vaccine coming from abroad, that will continue to be a, a big problem. So, um, as the one before last slide, it is uh, at least how COVAX uh, dose sharing mechanism is now live and will bring more of those uh, to the country that are participating. You know, France agreed to donate 5% of its bilateral procured uh, dose of COVAX in 2021. New Zealand as well provided. Spain is an, uh, Spain announced sharing 5 to 10%. Sweden announced as well to contribute. And the UAE announced donation of 1 million dose to COVAX. And more are coming. So those uh, is the solution that are try to mitigate the challenges that I indicated in my previous uh, my previous uh, slide. So this will really help where, uh, to see that some country are able and available to, to, to share uh, this. And my last slide, it is also uh, a country indicated demand to purchase additional doses through cost sharing. And uh, uh, you can see that, for example, financing, and I think our colleague for World Bank is there, like bank, bank banking are uh, contributing to give loan to country for them to be able to financing ad additional vaccine, either to COVAX, either to a particular country. And in terms of uh, supply expectation, 
For participation who, sub can, uh, who submitted requests to additional doses, COVAX will also confirm how many it expects to be able to provide in, in 2021 and early 2022, because we expect that in 2022, at least we should uh, reach uh, the immunity, the collective immunity. But this will depend to the mitigation of uh, the challenge that I indicated. And, uh, you know, uh, the last, it's a vaccine preference and confirmation. Uh, we have a number of vaccines that are participating in the trial, and there are many. So this, as much as they are being important, as much as we have chance to have a number of vaccine on the market. And the timeline and next step is the supply expectation and next step to commitment to purchase those will also communicate it shortly by uh, uh, the COVAX. And uh, we hope that uh, this, uh, uh, the, this challenge that I indicated will be mitigated. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if COVID-19 is spreading in uh, your community, stay safe by taking some simple precaution that uh, we use to uh, indicate every time, like physical distancing, wearing the mask, keeping room ventilated, avoid crowds, uh, uh, cleaning hands, everything that those will help in addition to vaccine. Even if you are vaccinating, 100% that will, will not guarantee uh, the opening of the border without associating them uh, with other measures until uh, we have a collective immunity in the world, not in 10 countries, uh, in globally or in Europe or in America or in some country. It has to be globally because it's a pandemic, it's not uh, 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 an epidemic which is affecting few countries, is affecting all countries. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, opening the border will depend to the mitigation of uh, those challenges I indicated. Otherwise, uh, the disease will continue uh, to circulate in some country and resurgence. I am mixing uh, some words in French and, uh, and English, resurgence, and if there is that resurgence, it, it, will, it will become again, again another waiver, another waiver, another waiver, and that will not contribute to uh, uh, the opening of the border. So I will stop here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, and thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, important discussion. Uh, so if you have a few questions, I can respond to them because I am really very busy. I have to go in another meeting and I will excuse myself. Otherwise, you can send the, the question to the, to, to the chat and I will respond later. Otherwise, I have a few minutes to respond to your question if you have some. Over to you, uh, Pierre. Thank you very much, Dr. Musango. It was extremely interesting and, and sobering. Um, yes, we'll have the question and answer for the rest of the presentation um, in about 35, 40 minutes. But if anyone has any question they would like to raise uh, with Dr. Musango because he, before he has to leave, please, let's take a few minutes. Um, uh, just a few questions if I can, Pierre. This is Ali. Um, I'll just give you the questions and then you can address them. The first question was, you said we can't open borders until people are vaccinated, but uh, Mauritius did operate a very successful quarantine regime uh, without vaccine. So I'm wondering whether it is possible to just have a good quarantine regime and not have to wait for vaccination. The second question is related to the regional collaboration. Um, other than South Africa, what are other countries in the region um, that might be able to produce vaccine and what would be required if Mauritius were to be uh, one of those countries? 
Okay, interesting question. Uh, I will start by uh, the, the first one of uh, quarantine. Yes, I agree with you, fully agree with you, and uh, really uh, quarantine regime protected a lot, a lot, a lot. I, I don't have uh, the presentation or the, I will share with you the paper that I wrote, uh, the BMC, which is showing how Mauritius is a country in African region with less a number of even in uh, almost in the world in, with the less case of COVID-19 and this there is no other secret is due to uh, the quarantine because all cases are stopped in the quarantine they are stopped there but but economists you can correct me but I'm sure I'm not wrong this is impacting negatively to the economy so uh, it is a matter of saying okay let's open close ourselves and being protected uh, against COVID-19 but without opening our border without collaborating with the rest of the, the world that cannot work we have to uh, start of course with uh, this quarantine regime combine this regime you have seen that on the second waiver we move now on the dedicated sub region of quarantine of uh, lockdown what you are calling the red zone to avoid the spreading of the disease from the red zone to spread in the in, in the in, in the in the island and this is making balance between economy and health we are keeping health as a priority but still making uh, uh, at least uh, the chance of having some uh, economy, uh, economic activities. So now those must be, you will see on Sunday, we will launch with the Premier Minister the, the campaign of sensitizing the population to use the rest of the measures, mask, physical distancing, opening the, 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 the windows, etc., etc. You will see all things will be launched on Sunday. And these are going with the campaign vaccination. And the good news today we receive 500 uh, 500,000 vaccine which is increasing the number so that will allow us maybe to have 60 percent or 70 percent of the population being vaccinated in august or september those are combined measures but that also must go with other country because look if madagascar is not vaccinating people or bangladesh or uh, India and workers who are coming from that country are coming in Mauritius. Of course, we'll continue this politics of uh, quarantine regime, but this must go. There is no one solution. I can say that there is no one solution. We can, we have to compare to combine both. So now regional collaboration to produce vaccine. Well, you know, producing vaccine, it's not an easy thing. Uh, they are lifting this license, but the capacity building is not is also needed. You cannot impro uh, improvise yourself and saying I'm going to produce a vaccine. No, they need skill. They need uh, infrastructure. They need too many things. So uh, WHO at least evaluated them so that a country like South Africa and, uh, and um, India can produce very well and, and they have almost the capacity. But uh, a country like Mauritius will need an accompaniment, will need a support from those countries that are producing already to send people to, 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 to transfer the capacity in Mauritius. But Mauritius can apply, like Rwanda applied already, uh, and I'm sure that Rwanda it can, can be comp comparable to Mauritius. So any country uh, Rwanda can uh, apply, Mauritius can uh, apply as well, but this will need really a transfer of capacity and capacity building, and of course uh, increase of uh, increase of uh, uh, infrastructure. Over to you. I hope I responded to your question, Ali. Thank you very much, Dr. Musango. Sorry, um, Gary. One quick follow-up. I understood you said that capacity needs to be built, and we understand that. But it took one year to develop vaccines, which was much faster than people thought because people put a lot of effort. Supposing 
in the region people want to produce vaccine? You talked of Rwanda, you talked of Mauritius. Um, are there other countries that might do it? And what would be required in terms of how much time would it take to set up that capacity? And what sort of uh, investment in human capital and, and physical investment would be needed to well, build up you, vaccine capacity it, production in the region? Yeah, yeah. Interesting question. You know, it's it's depend to the cooperation, uh, bilateral cooperation. A country can start and saying, OK, I'm collaborating with uh, Serum Institute of India. They will send me people to, to, to produce locally with existing infrastructure and progressively I will build the capacity of Mauritian to take over, you know. So that means that can start even in two months, right? But if it's saying, okay, let me build capacity of Mauritian until they will be able to send them maybe in a, a, a country that is producing until they will be able to produce it, that will take time. And both options can start, starting by sending people in those uh, countries that are producing that and starting with the uh, uh, foreigners who are producing in, in your country and then progressively those when those will come uh, from abroad, they can take over. You know, it's a combination of, uh, it's like a game you are, you are discussing the, with the manufacturer and see which is the best option that can allow you to produce as quickly as possible. Over to you and thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very, it was a very interesting presentation and a very interesting discussion. I think what we will do now is we will move to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Mansour. And if you would like to put your uh, any other questions um, in the chat or I'm going to send you my email address, you can send them to me in writing and then we can work with WHO uh, maybe for question and answers and we can then circulate these answers to you. If that would work with uh, with everyone uh, and if Mr. Mansour you would like uh, to start. Thank you again uh, Dr. Musango that was very interesting. Okay thank you very much to all of you and uh, have a nice meeting uh, next time. Okay thank you very much to all of you and uh, have a nice meeting uh, next time. Well first thank you to Dr. Musango since you're leaving for the very uh, interesting and uh, practical presentation you made and I'd like to pick up from where you started. First, uh, I'll say something about what RMC has done with the support of the World Bank, but I think based on what Dr. Musango said, maybe there's potential to do more, um, which I would like to sort of put to the bank to think about. But first, in summary, with the help of the bank, we put a platform together which allowed a matching of demand for PPE and uh, supply of PPE from the, the region. The platform, I think, uh, worked well technically. The problem we ran into is that the procurement side wasn't dealt with in a way that would allow regional uh, production to be, to be encouraged. And I think there were two obstacles to that. We understood in the beginning that the World Bank was going to be centralizing procurement, at least for the funds that it was providing to countries for PPE. And we thought the bank was going to validate that production offers were competitive and then facilitate that where there was production that was competitive, it would actually be used. The second thing, which again, we started a dialogue with the World Bank trying to see whether we could get countries to collaborate on a package that could have been supported by the World Bank and other donors exactly to help them open up their borders in a safe way, which would have involved a quarantine regime, but a quarantine regime that uh, would, that travelers would find more acceptable than maybe some of the tougher quarantine regimes which are in place, or the alternative, no quarantine with an outbreaks. The dialogue, I think, went very well, but again, the RMC can only facilitate things. It doesn't have the it doesn't have the depth of representation or penetration in the countries to be able to push policy agendas, and that's where we needed sort of stronger 
collaboration with the bank. It's not very clear what happened in the bank, but the proposal for a regional project, which we were working on, seems to have faded away. So I think that RMC can be a very useful platform. We brought people together from a half dozen countries uh, in Africa. Africa, and we could have built an interesting project, but of course, we could only build an interesting project supporting the efforts of the World Bank or other development partners. We cannot do it on our own. And for reasons I don't fully understand, I think the bank didn't follow through on the idea of a regional project. This leads me to the future. Again, um, producing in the region, I think as Dr. Musangio said, may be something which we want to encourage. And certainly if South Africa can supply the whole region, there's no need to solve problems which don't exist. But to the extent that there's likely to be excess demand for some time, and to the extent that um, other production in the region would be useful, I see scope here for a partnership between the IFC, the World Bank Group, the RMC, to try to put something together where we could do exactly the sort of transfer of technology that Dr. Musango was talking about, transfer of technology from India, from South Africa, and maybe from uh, um, the other countries producing the vaccines in favor of some African production. And as we've seen around the world, notwithstanding that we all know that, the vac that it's optimal for the world to share the vaccine, but Domestic politics has made that virtually impossible. France is sitting on a huge stock of AstraZeneca vaccine, for example, that it has no intention of using. It doesn't want to use it. It doesn't think it's a good vaccine, um, but it's not give, It's only giving away a small part of that away. So production in the region is one way to ensure that the countries in the region don't end up at the bottom of the pile, which is where they are now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mansour, for this presentation. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you once again uh, for giving um, Commissar Secretariat the opportunity to be part of this uh, important meeting. Um, as far as uh, COMESA is concerned, we, uh, we present um, basically what COMESA uh, has been doing to mitigate uh, COVID's effect uh, uh, during this uh, COVID period uh, from its start. Uh, please, could you go to the second slide? Thank you. Um, so this is just a quick um, reminder for what COMESA uh, is uh, in terms of uh, its coverage, the membership. Uh, we are 21 uh, member states uh, with two country, uh, Tunisia and Somalia, who joined um, uh, last 2018. So uh, COMESA was established in 1994 uh, and we have a population of about um, almost a half of uh, uh, population of Africa, five uh, and 83 million people with a GDP um, of almost um, uh, more than eight uh, hundred billion USD and the coverage area as it is. Uh, next. So um, the main objective uh, of COMESA, of course, in line with the uh, with, with this uh, um, also uh, pandemic is to initiate and promote cooperation program and regional integration aimed at achieve the removal of all physical, technical, physical and monetary barrier to intra-regional trade 
and increase commercial exchange of goods and services between member states and beyond while ensuring the well-being of, it, of its people. So uh, um, whatever we do, we really wish to make sure all the barriers to trade uh, are removed. So um, as for what Comesa uh, undertook to uh, mitigate the, um, the effect of COVID, first of all, uh, at the outbreak of the pandemic, uh, Comesa established a technical team uh, to coordinate the resource mobilization activities and effort from the external source to support member states to manage COVID-19 uh, pandemic. It also engaged and cooperate with uh, 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 benefactors and development partner for resource mobilization. While uh, we were developing and submitting a uh, uh, grant proposal for funding, we also undertook to renegotiate uh, existing contract to make sure uh, uh, the, 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 uh, we can get an amendment to, uh, to cover or to incorporate uh, uh, activities to, uh, related to um, COVID, uh, uh, to curbing the spread of COVID. Next. So um, as part of uh, technical and resource mobilization, in collaboration with its agencies, uh, COMESA provided support to um, uh, Continental COVID Response Fund uh, through its uh, Trade Development Bank, uh, who donated um, around 500 uh, Southern to support COVID responses across Africa by the Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, the other thing is that um, the Secretariat also have been, um, uh, was able to distribute uh, uh, protect personal protective equipment in some border, in some key border points. And also the, uh, the, the, the Trade Development Bank donated locally procured personal protective equipment and COVID testing consumable to Zambia, Ethiopia, Uganda, DRC, Swatini, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Djibouti, etc. Uh, it also provided a credit facility to support women in business to increase the production capacity in some essential commodity occasioned by health emergency in collaboration with Comesa Federation of National Association of Women. Uh, in addition, uh, we also collaborate with the African Development Bank, uh, which in principle has uh, earmarked a grant of amount uh, of 2.3 million USD for a project of three years to strengthen in the capacity of pharmaceutical manufacturing enterprise. Um, we next, next, please. Yeah. Um, still in line with the technical and resource mobilization. We also, uh, as the COMESA, we think implementation of the uh, COMESA digital free trade area, uh, like e-commerce, e-logistics, e-registration, is a key area of intervention to facilitate trades uh, amid the physical restriction uh, by member states in fight against rapid spread of COVID-19 pandemic. We've been raising uh, awareness, communication and capacity building to all border management officials and stakeholders 
uh, in collaboration with our um, a partner, especially EU, uh, in this regard. Uh, Commissar Secretariat, uh, through the uh, um, uh, Resource Mobilization and uh, uh, International Cooperation Unit, in collaboration with the ZIPRI, which is a, a Commissar agency in, in insurance uh, 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 sector, is in advance stage, whereby we are developing a policy paper or proposal for the establishment of Commissar Pandemic Risk Pool Fund. Uh, this uh, aim to provide member states with a swift response mechanism to dealing with uh, future pandemic outbreaks and products and services that will um, facilitate uh, both uh, public and private sector to uh, um, alleviate from the uh, negative impact of uh, uh, future pandemics. Next, please. Um, we, we've also uh, uh, been able to facilitate safe cross-border mobility, migration and related uh, trade flow. And some of the action uh, include assessing the training awareness raise, raising needs in Comesa member states regarding border management in the framework of public health emergencies and crises. We've been uh, building the capacities of border officials of Comesa member states to manage the movement of people during uh, uh, public health emergencies, enhancing dialogue and uh, interagencies cooperation at Comesa member states in the field of border management as well as cross-border cooperation to better address health-related challenges. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we are raising awareness. We continue to raise awareness among migrant and mob mobile population crossing the borders including small-scale cross-border traders and truck drivers of the measure in place at the border in the framework of the current COVID-related uh, 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 crisis. We've been also been able to um, make in-kind donation to informal small-scale cross-border traders. Uh, as you might be aware, uh, uh, this is um, a kind of a vulnerability uh, um, um, part of the uh, um, traders, which are uh, basically um, trading in um, small um, scale, uh, whereby they really uh, needed such support in, in like uh, some uh, equipment and tools like masks, um and the associated next so apart from the uh, technical and resource uh, mobilization we we've been also undertaking some trade and transport facilitation um as we are all aware at the out outbreak of the pandemic each and every uh, sovereign state would uh, undertake unilateral and, and coordinated measure. Uh, and this resulted into uh, heightening uh, restriction in cross-border trade. So COMESA uh, being at the heart of uh, trade integration, we uh, subsequently uh, put uh, in place measures to facilitate intra-regional trade amidst the pandemic. Comesa's intervention have been uh, premised uh, on its core undertaking, as earlier mentioned, to respect to trade liberalization and customs cooperation. So the focus uh, was at basically to make sure the, the, the space are opened for cooperation and dialogue among the member states. 
when instituting these various major uh, and make sure uh, um, trade continues, trade of goods and services continues across the border. Next. So part of uh, the uh, um, initiative was to establish a uh, guideline uh, which were in line with the Comesa Treaty as uh, here indicated. So, um, and this measure um, and guideline was to protect citizens from the COVID virus pandemic while at the same time safeguarding the existing trading arrangements in order to minimize the disruption to cross-border trades in goods and services. We, the guideline also ensure uh, the continuity flow of essential goods and services, including but not limited to foods and pharmaceutical supplies during the lockdowns. The guideline also encourage, encourages efficiency in customs clearance, especially at border points for truck and business person while ensuring safety. Uh, next. The guideline facilitates uh, cooperation and coordination among member states. They enhance regional awareness on measures instituted against the COVID-19 pandemic by various authorities to stakeholders regarding the measures uh, involved uh, involving the movement of goods and services in the region. And of course, it's, they also advocate and support member states' health safety measures and effort to address uh, uh, the, the, the closure of uh, so many business as, as we could see uh, 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 during this uh, pandemic. Next. So um, when the, the, the guideline for COMESA were, um, were approved, uh, I think um, the, the, the other region uh, realized um, in, in, in the framework of the tripartite, this was a good initiative to replicate in, a, in, in other uh, trading block, whereby uh, the tripartite, uh, uh, composed of uh, SADC and, and EAC. So at the Tripartite Council of Ministers uh, in July 2020, they adopted uh, the, same, uh, the, the same guideline with, the, of course, uh, with um, some amendments um, as to um, apply the same in, in the Tripartite region. So uh, among the, 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 the key principles uh, uh, for the tripartite guideline and uh, the standards um, operating procedure, uh, we uh, the following. So uh, the principle was to have the type of COVID test to be performed on drivers and crew before commencement of cross-border trip and other borders. So only drivers with negative COVID test results will be allowed to undertake a um, cross-border trip across the, 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 the tripartite uh, area. The validity period uh, of negative uh, COVID test results uh, and also agree on the uh, mutual recognition of the COVID test results between and among all the member partner states and RICS. Uh, together with the implementation of integrated and harmonized electronic surveillance and monitoring system to monitor drivers, uh, driver health, truck drivers and vehicle, uh, and for uh, contact tracing. So these are the initiative 
uh, uh, that complemented uh, COMESA um, uh, undertakings. Um, in line with the uh, uh, implementation of uh, COMESA digital free trade area, COMESA developed uh, an online, uh, a COVID online platform whose overall objective uh, is to provide business facilitation solution for COMESA region amidst uh, COVID-19. But also I should mention that uh, the platform would also continue even beyond COVID. So the portal is intended to bring the 21st, uh, the 21 COMESA member states and its business community to a virtual information platform of essential products, especially um, pharmaceutical products, uh, food, uh, fuel, and other locally produced goods to ensure sustainability of livelihood during the pandemic. The platform will also help member states, business community, and citizens of Comesa region and beyond with goods and services produced and available within the region and contact details of suppliers and buyers. Next. So the platform uh, is meant to assist member states with potential to produce and supply different type of goods, especially the essential product, food supplies, as well as connect buyer to supplier, thereby promoting and fostering regional intra commerce trade. So uh, cross-border traders can actually uh, access trade-related uh, regulatory measures in response to the COVID and promote implementation of the um, uh, guideline I mentioned earlier. So um, basically this platform uh, was uh, is is an uh, is an information exchange uh, uh, platform whereby um, suppliers, buyers, and 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 any other person in the community in the commercial region can access any information regarding product uh, uh, um, produced in the region and and by member states. Uh, 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 to uh, and, and ultimately uh, buyers and suppliers can make deals out of this platform uh, apart from uh, uh, sharing information at all uh, um, uh, levels. Next. So the, the, the other initiative uh, uh, by Comesa was to undertake a study on social economic impact of the COVID pandemic uh, from an evidence uh, based from Comesa region. So uh, the, the study uh, was in light of the restrictive measures that disrupted global demand and supply with spillover effect across all the sectors of economies due to global interconnectivity. So this study presents insight into the COVID impact on key macroeconomic indicator trades and trade related issue, an aspect of social and organizational culture in the COMESA member states. Uh, the, study, the study provides um, some recommendations to both uh, secretariat and member states uh, for consideration. So for any uh, information and content of that study, uh, it, is, or it is on the uh, COMESA website and is accessible, it's a public, uh, um, it's within the public domain. So other initiative uh, um, that were undertaken by COMESA includes um, various activities, um, whereby um, uh, we also have uh, been uh, contributing as corporate social responsibility. Comesa has been able, uh, its, its staff members has been able to donate, to make some donation to uh, 
to our host. We also have some initiative to uh, consider gender and social activities uh, uh, during this pandemic. We've been cooperating with the uh, um, uh, CDC and, and um, in different areas whereby uh, CDC have been uh, advising and giving uh, guidance to um, the Secretariat. We also um, collect and uh, publish some uh, COVID-related uh, information in member states. Uh, so briefly, this uh, um, ends my presentation. Uh, and I really thank you very much uh, once again for your kind attention. Uh, and we'll be happy to um, take some uh, questions or uh, comments or contribution to this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alice. Thank you very much uh, um, for inviting me to join, to join the session. Um, like you said, I am the, currently the CEO of the Seychelles Tourism Board and uh, soon also will take up the position of Principal Secretary um, for Tourism. And I am not a doctor, so I will not try or attempt to go too much into um, doctor's uh, um, scientific data or details um, from, from a health point of view. But I'm here to share, if I understand very well, the Seychelles experience in terms of uh, vaccination and the outlook on opening the borders. At current, Seychelles are being used as case studies, and I won't be surprised if, uh, if uh, scholars start using Seychelles in their case studies, because I think globally we are being used as case studies because uh, Given we are small, we have a small population and per capita, we always make news to be one of the highest in the world in everything we do. And that's uh, all because of the smallness um, of our population as well. For example, we've made news as being one of the most vaccination, vaccinated nation in the world again. And uh, recently when we receive um, um, uh, we receive a spike in the uh, number of COVID cases, COVID-19 cases in Seychelles. We also made headlines in terms of one of the highest, having the highest infection rate in the world, even if the numbers, the absolute numbers were actually very small. But again, because uh, we're less than 100,000 in terms of population, we always make headlines for one reason or the other. Um, I don't have a presentation, but I hope my presentation, um, my sharings will be clear and legible enough. I will start, uh, I understand I have 15 minutes, I will try to keep to the 15 minutes. Um, I will start by talking a little bit about the vaccination in Seychelles um, uh, and the uh, decision for us. How did we go about in terms of opening the destination on the 25th of March? Um, a little bit how we've done so far as tourism and of course I'll close my presentation a little bit in terms of the recent COVID cases in Seychelles knowing that we made world's headlines again and uh, putting things a little bit into perspective in my closing statement as well to um, perhaps what is the takeaway from, from all of this from a Seychelles point of view as well. So as you probably most of you are aware, yes, we are one of the world's most vaccinated uh, nation. 63% um, of our total population have actually been fully vaccinated, as in taken both doses of, uh, of the vaccine. And as you, uh, our population is only um, a little bit over 98,000. So the, the target has always been for us to try and vaccinate um, 70,000 of the population, 70,000, which we are now, in terms of first those, we are 99.9% to it. We, we, we have about uh, less than 100 people to receive the first dose to meet the target. But in terms of second dose, we're still at 88% of our targeted population 
But like I said, in terms of total population, we are 63%. Um, uh, so the idea when uh, we decided to open the, the borders on the 25th of March um, was that uh, um, um, as you probably uh, uh, realize, Seychelles, we are, we are almost entirely dependent on tourism for our survival. We do uh, receive uh, um, uh, we do we do receive uh, foreign exchange. We do receive earnings from other sectors, but it's very small in comparison to what um, tourism contributes. We get about uh, three million U.S. dollars in our system, banking system, every single day in a good year on average from tourism alone. And uh, it was since last year that uh, um, we had to close our borders in June, in, in March last year. Um, uh, and we were practically not receiving any visitors until we reopened in August. But when we reopened in August, there were very strict measures. We did receive a bit of visitors. We had to um, reinforce the measures in January 2021 when uh, we started uh, getting cases in the community, COVID-19 cases in the community. So ever since we reopened in August, it was only late, very late in December, early January that we started uh, getting community spread. So all this time um, it was it was uh, it was managed in a way that uh, um, uh, um, people were, were, were there were measures put in place every time we would receive new cases. Um, but the dynamic of Seychelles changes in, um, in, in this year, more specifically because um, we are dependent on tourism. We have not been really um, collecting a lot of revenue. And uh, what we realized, we had a lot of schemes and supports for employees, for example, um, in, especially in tourism establishments. And uh, um, our debt level, we're going up, um, the government could not continue sustaining all these schemes with no revenues coming in or very little, if I should use the word, very little revenues coming in. How do you keep sustaining uh, people, uh, giving them a salary while they are not working and keep keeping the borders closed or maybe not closed, but the entry requirements were so restricted that between January and March, there were very, very little visitors coming in. It was under, the average was under 100 per day. So this is a little bit the rationale why the decisions has to be taken because uh, it was a balancing act between uh, managing COVID-19 and managing the economy, which was in a dire state at that, at that time. And when we reopened the borders on the 25th of March, immediately uh, we started receiving visitors. The entry requirements was uh, uh, very simple. Our visitors required a 72 hours <laughs> negative PCR test to enter. Um, uh, we are open to both vaccinated and non-vaccinated visitors. And visitors are not required to, to do any quarantine. Um, so they are free to um, visit, uh, to, to go on excursion, visit uh, the various sightseeing places. The only thing we ask of them is that they stay in a COVID safe uh, certified establishments. So these establishments have a uh, strict uh, standard operating procedures and uh, um, they are trained also how to handle clients in this new normal. And of course, um, like everywhere else, wear their mask in public places, keep social distancing where, where required, and uh, keep uh, we, we, we do contact tracing for every location they go to and uh, um, hand sanitizing and all that, just like it is in most countries. And uh, what we've seen, very good arrivals. Um, we were getting and we are still getting on average 500 visitors a day, which is about half, half, 50% uh, of what we would normally do in a good year. Um, in a good year, normally we get a little bit over a thousand visitors. And, uh, but what has made news in recent, uh, in recent days 
was the fact that all of a sudden uh, we had a, a spike in COVID cases. And uh, there were a lot of assumptions and a lot of people were, were making their own, uh, their own judgment from uh, perhaps the vaccines are not working and uh, um, a lot of uh, um, fingers were being pointed at, at the efficacy of, of the vaccine that Seychelles was taking at that time. But we all know since the very beginning when we started taking the vaccine in Seychelles at least, we all knew that uh, the vaccine, regardless of which brand you are taking, um, it's uh, less effective at uh, stopping somebody from getting the infection, but it's more effective at uh, the severity of the cases. And this is exactly what we found in Seychelles. Though we received the spike, very, very little were actually admitted in the hospital. Actually, for last week, we only, the last figures I had, we only had 63 admission out of 1,903 active cases. And very, very little out of these were critical. Actually, the figure I have was uh, for last, uh, since Monday, it was four. And uh, out of the cases where that have been um, uh, admin, admin, admission, the admission cases, very little are actually um, uh, vaccinated people, most most uh, of the admission were unvaccinated people. And out of the active cases that we have, 67% are people so who are not vaccinated at all. Um, so it, it, the figures itself supports the assumption that we made since the beginning that uh, um, uh, the vaccine will actually help in, in, in reducing the severity of cases. Um, uh, and it also shows that uh, what really curbs down um, the level of infection in a country is actually the, um, it's, it's, your, it's your sanitary measures. The sanitary measures still remains the most important and most effective way to reduce infection. And we realized the spike in, in cases um, uh, resulted after we had two major um, holiday celebration. One was Easter and the second one was the May Day celebration where despite advisory from public health, um, uh, people still manage to find ways to, to, to still have gatherings. And we know how whenever there are these kind of gatherings, it always end up with a spike in cases. And also most recently, there was a bit of measures that were removed. So um, people were allowed to go and visit families, um, uh, bars were allowed to reopen. So when the country registered the, the spike, what happened? Um, Obviously, certain measures were reintroduced. For example, again, um, uh, it was uh, bars um, uh, have to be closed earlier, even shops, because a lot of people gather around shops areas to drink. Um, so shops uh, um, have to close a little bit earlier. Schools opening, because um, mostly every school were in, in big holiday, the, the kids uh, were in holiday. So schools were closed a little bit. Um, their opening have been pushed by a few weeks. Just, I, I believe here the strategy was tackling the areas where we we know there are vulnerabilities or weaknesses. And here, this is why, why these areas um, were tackled. But the airport remained open. Um, we noticed that infections were very, very little amongst visitors. And even for this week, it's even much lower. Um, so the airport remained open. Visitors can visit Seychelles uninterrupted. Um, and uh, I believe the, the takeaway in, in all of this is the fact that uh, the vaccine is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. It's uh, um, uh, ensuring that if you get infected, um, your cases are not severe. And we've realized that uh, the, the, co the community spread has been more amongst the statistics shows. It's more amongst Seychelles, amongst us locals, and it is not being imported really by, uh, by visitors. 
um, and that uh, the most effective way to, to contain the, the infection is for us to continuously maintain all the sanitary measures which Seychelles have this. We also have penalties for people who do not wear their mask in public places, um, just like other countries are using. And uh, should we are able to, to, to keep a grip on the important uh, on what's important in this pandemic, I believe we can still manage to to balance the the, the health of the economy and the health of the of the population in a in a good way. You cannot keep your borders forever closed, um, especially when you depend on tourism for your livelihood. And uh, but you just need to 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 have a good balancing act. So this is my sharing for today. I don't know if there's any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Francis. It was very interesting and, and, and good to hear from you about uh, the case of Seychelles, because uh, as you said, many people can draw their own conclusions, so it's very important to have it uh, reframed uh, from you. Uh, um, so, uh, I will pass on the mic uh, to Eric from the World Bank, who is going to um, uh, to take over for, for discussion. Now, we were supposed to go until 12 only, uh, but it's already 12. So if you please would have uh, another, another 15 or 20 minutes, uh, anyone would like to be part of the discussion, please. Eric, go ahead. Thank you okay. again. Thank you very much, Pierre, and uh, thanks for all our, to all our contributors. Uh, as usual, a very interesting um, discussion. I'm glad to see that we've broadened the, the focus to, to Seychelles and, and possibly to, to other countries in the region through the Comesa link. Um, before I open the floor, let me just very quickly um, say a few things on my on my own behalf. Um, Ali certainly made a, uh, a number of interesting suggestions for, for World Bank uh, support or what the World Bank can do in this context. Um, I think we're really doing our best to, to, to do a lot of these things. Um, the, the financing that was also mentioned in Dr. Musango's presentation is certainly available for our, all our client countries, including Mauritius, including Seychelles, um, for the purchase of vaccines, as well as any other expenses related to um, administering the vaccines, PPE, etc. cetera. Um, I think the uh, scramble at first for PPE and now, now for vaccines at a global level um, has unfortunately really been a bit of a humbling experience for all of us who believe in and work on international coordination and international cooperation. Um, yes, we, we tried our best to uh, help countries structure and organize the market for, for these things, um, both on the PPE and on the vaccine side. Um, and of course, at the end of the day, you know, we, we, we often see our limitations, of course, when we finance these things, we make sure that all procurement follows 100% uh, transparent uh, and approved practices. Um, but uh, of course, we, we we cannot control something that that we're not um, directly involved in as, as financiers. Um, that's just on my own behalf. I will now open uh, the floor for discussions. And um, if I may take the privilege of also asking the first question, then uh, you know, we'll, we'll collect a few more. Um, Shireen, thank you very much for, for this very interesting remarks. If you could comment a little bit on the tourism marketing aspect of the reopening, because I think it has been quite remarkable how quickly tourism has come back. And certainly having all these headlines in the international press, as you were saying about you know, the highest infection rate despite vaccination, uh, wasn't wasn't exactly helpful in, in getting more tourists to come back to Seychelles. So I would love to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, how you communicated around the reopening, around these headlines, and that surely would also be of, of great interest to our uh, colleagues here in Mauritius. But before I hand it back over to you, let's let's hear a few more questions. Um, maybe raise your hands uh, in Teams, or if nobody else is speaking, just speak up. And come in. Going once, <laughs> going twice. 
Okay, maybe Sherwin, you could uh, address my question and uh, perhaps others will, will think of more questions in the meantime. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, for us, uh, uh, when we, we, we reopened our borders, we realized that our traditional core markets, these are the markets where we, we spent, um, we, we've had made the most investments in, um, most of them, the, the likes of the Germany, um, the French, uh, the Britain and all that, um, it, there were still a lot of restrictions for, for travel. So we knew um, in, that we could not depend on Western Europe at all for recovery. And this is where we started uh, um, exploring other secondary markets. So, um, to our advantage, uh, Eastern Europe has been a market where we, start, we started investment about a uh, couple years ago, maybe um, a little bit almost a decade ago. No, not a lot of money, but I am building the relationship has been key. So um, for us, it was it was basically going back to to those um, those partners we have invested in do not a lot, I said, and, and really go a little bit more aggressive with our communication in these markets. We, we were using market intelligence a lot, so we could understand which markets there were demand for travel. And uh, um, we could also um, figure out and point out um, where there were demand for Seychelles as well, because you could see what people are searching, when they are searching, what dates they are searching for holidays, for example. So instantly, the minute we see there is any traction in those markets, this is where we would enter a bit more aggressively with our communication and making them understand um, that we are open. We are open with very easy entry requirements because we realized this was actually the main impediment for people to actually make a booking was understanding the travel requirements, which for a lot of countries um, were seen to be still a little bit too complicated. Or if you need quarantine was already a deterrent for travel. Um, a lot of people would not um, accept to travel if they have to be quarantined for seven or 14 days in a destination before they can actually um, experience the destination. And especially most of them on an average, they are coming for 10 days. So um, markets that we've, we've been receiving visitors have been, uh, um, it started with Israel and UA, actually started with UA and then Israel and then Israel overtook um, UA and then we started getting traction from Russia. And now today Russia is our number one market. We are having uh, three direct flights a week from Bayeroflut, and in June it's supposed to be more moving to four, four frequency a week. And, uh, and then we are having a little bit almost everywhere from different Eastern European countries, from Czech Republic, Ukraine, Poland, um, Romania. We are also having once a week um, uh, four charter series. Um, Asia is actually the one doing the charter to Romania as well, and hopefully very soon we'll also be having a few charters from other Eastern European countries. We were having good traction from India, but unfortunately um, the recent uh, um, issues in India, we've had to, to close our borders to India, um, but also this would have been a very good market for us as well. And in terms of the negative news, um, since uh, a little bit more than a week when, when we started making headlines as being the, one of the most infected country in the world, yet the most vaccinated country, we were very quick to respond, to respond because we realized if we did not respond, um, all this information out there will be taken out of context because when you actually analyze the article, you would have the view that people are just dying in dozens in Seychelles. People are dying on the streets. There's not enough hospital bed. We don't like the issue is out of control. There's not even enough oxygen. This is the interpretation of when you read certain of these articles that were going out. So we were very quick to respond, um, balancing, giving a balanced view of what actually was the situation for Seychelles. And uh, we also had to ensure that each of these press coming out with reports 
they received um, uh, our articles as well and our response to whatever reports they were posting. So a lot of them actually, if you follow now, a lot of the news have actually turned into a much more positive tone because we reached out to each and every single one of them, giving our version of the story with the facts in there. And uh, we also received the assistance of certain press whom we've been having long-standing working relationship with in terms of um, ensuring that factual informations were going out and giving, it's true, we were having a surge, we never hide this, but balancing the, giving a balanced view of the situation. And of course, reassuring our visitors and those who had made bookings to Seychelles that Seychelles still remain safe. Um, uh, the borders are still open. Visitors um, journey are still uninterrupted. They can still have a holiday in Seychelles. And the fact that we are by nature a very socially distancing holiday destination. So you can you, you can have a holiday in Seychelles without the need to be in any crowds whatsoever. If you want to be just isolated with you and your family, you can do that in Seychelles. And you, th there's very little touch points for you to even get infected. And uh, so far, like I said, visitors are still coming. Um, uh, we have not really seen a direct correlation, a direct impact on arrivals so far. Um, uh, the cancellations we've received are more in relation to Israel, but as you know, Israel right now, there's a lot of other issues going on, which is not related to the pandemic as well. And uh, the bookings have slowed down, but this does not have to correlate with the negative publicity we've received because normally we are entering a period, June, which is it's seasonal. It's normally a very slow period for Seychelles, traditionally, even during a good year. So for us, it's a normal situation. It does not necessarily have to correlate with the negative publicity. Um, but we are still receiving on average 500 visitors a day. So um, uh, if we've lost a few bookings, we've gained as well. And uh, we are just hoping that uh, uh, we are able to, once Western Europe opens, we will be able to now build on the momentum with our traditional markets and hopefully get more of these hotels uh, filled up in, in, in the coming months because we, we really need that. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, any other discussion uh, points? Any questions? Any comments from the floor? Aha, uh -huh. I see a hand up. Darden, floor is yours. Yes, Darden from Business Mauritius. Uh, question to say, Shales, Sharon, <laughs> of course, um, uh, private sector agency here. Um, we were always, you know, always wondering what happens when you communicate early on some conditions and then the conditions change. We are in a very volatile environment. So, for example, you announced that there were no quarantines and then you closed down again in January and then you opened again in, in March. Um, is How does your public react to that? And uh, do people find it normal because they also probably have the same thing in their country or does it completely put off people in terms of they can sell everything and then they don't come back? So I think that was the, in Russia's we have the same situation. People are wondering if we announce something and then we change the conditions or we change the date, people are going to be angry. Do people get angry uh, or do people realize that even the countries, they have the same thing, so it's normal? Um, thank you for your question. Um, uh, we had in December when we um, actually the, the the time when we actually did open and then um, we did not close down, but there were um, we adjusted the measures. Um, we never really um, other than when we closed the airport, it was at the beginning of the pandemic. When we reopened, we never closed down the borders, but we just readjusted the measures. And there were a few countries which it was it was banned basically because we had very little information about the new variants and we needed to understand a little bit more and of course protect the the nation and we had mixed reaction from visitors who had made bookings um there were quite a bit 
who understand fully what was happening and they were happy because a lot of hotels in Seychelles were willing to to reschedule their holiday for later for a no no charge and, and I believe the airlines were doing the same as well and we also were encouraging um, hotels to if they want refunds to do it with no penalty which most hotels were doing it in January uh, when there were cancellation. Um, you would always have a, um, a handful of dissatisfied clients, especially those that were really, really looking forward for the holiday. But a lot of them did understand that uh, um, the situation is very fluid. It's beyond us. And uh, whenever I have my interviews, one thing that I do make clear as well is uh, um, we will try as much as possible um, to to maintain the measures for visitors as it is, but um, a lot of it does not depend on only us entirely because uh, as every country is doing, we have to monitor what's happening in the rest of the world. We have to monitor the evolution of the of the pandemic and and we have to react accordingly as well. But what we can try and do is ensuring that whenever the country have to take a decision that uh, um, our private sector um, does provide the cushion for these visitors that they, they don't have to pay cancellation fee. Um, they can um, reschedule their holiday for a later date without the need to 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 incur any any cost, which uh, most of them were, they were actually doing. But this time around, when we had the surge, one thing we maintained was the fact that. Uh, Regardless of what we do, we are not going to we are not going to reintroduce quarantine, and we will keep the borders open. Um, uh, we instead reinforce on the domestic measures, so um, uh, there were much more <clears throat> education in the news about uh, all the sanitary measures. Um, we have uh, conduct another series of training for uh, various hotel properties and the focus were a little bit more on large and medium sized properties because we realized they are managing a larger number of guests and uh, we need to reinforce on the trainings here, especially uh, tackling um, meeting management here because uh, um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the where weaknesses were identified also have to do with uh, how how firm the management is in terms of m ensuring all the measures in the established for hotels, all the SOPs are being followed. So it was more identifying where the where we feel the weaknesses are and strengthening it domestically. Like I said, we've realized in the figures that um, infections were very, very little amongst visitors. Our bigger problem is in managing um, our population here is in getting them not to not to do gatherings, not to be uh, grouping and and all this. And definitely uh, most visitors, at least around the 30,000 odd visitors we've received, very little leave the country infected or not the word leave the country, but when they do their exit PCR test, they, they test positive, very, very little of them. So we realize the problem is actually not the visitors coming. The problem, the weaknesses is actually in the population. And this is where I, we have strengthened on education, strengthening on communication um, uh, amongst the population as well. And this is where the measures have been reinforced more. But just to answer your question here in a very short uh, short um, summary is the fact that uh, whenever you adjust measures especially when it when it affects visitors you will always have a, a certain small percentage of visitors not happy it's it's important in how you handle and manage them but the majority of them do understand that it is dynamic this is why the trend now is mostly a lot of visitors are booking within short period of their travel date again because they know how dy dynamic the situation are for every destination. Thank you, very useful, thanks. <laughs> You're most welcome. Okay, I see Ali's hand up as well and I think we'll have to make this the last round of questions so if anyone else 
wants to uh, come in after Ali speak quickly. Ali, um, of course. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, I had a question for Sharon. Has Seychelles been considering travel bubbles? Um, yes, it's actually we just signed an agreement with the UAE um, for uninterrupted travels between UAE and Seychelles for um, vaccinated visitors here. And uh, um, we intend also to consider um, other countries. But I think it's it's this is more for um, our national, um, our citizen to also be able to travel to those countries because there are countries who still have uh, um, strict travel um, um, entry requirements, if I should use the word. Um, for us, in terms of travel, most visitors, we, we are open to, to every country of the world, except for for the moment, it's South Africa, India, Bangladesh and Pakistan. That's the only four countries, um, but we are open and uh, a visitor does not require quarantine. Um, if you're a GOP holder or you're a returning resident, you will have to be quarantined um, on the other hand. And the reason for that is basically a visitor, when they come, they go into a safe certified establishments where there is a set of uh, SOPs. Um, in how um, they, are, they are handled in, in, the, in the establishments. But for a returning resident, um, if they are going back to live with families, for a GOP holder, same, they are mixing with other people. They probably be sharing facilities with other people. There's a greater level of risk here, and this is why the, the quarantine requirements for seven days were, were needed. But in terms of travel bubble, we have initiated with the UA, and there's intention for us to do with a few more countries. Thank you very much. Um, Pierre, I see your hand is up and I will uh, hand it over to you for the official closing remarks. Or did you have a have a question? I had a question. I'll try to make it very, very quick for now. And if it's too long, maybe we can take it offline. A question, please, uh, to Alice uh, from, from Comesa. Mm, you mentioned a pandemic, uh, setting up a pandemic pool fund for future crisis. And I just wanted to know if by any chance it was linked with the work of the um, Africa Risk Capacity, which is uh, a technical agency of the African Union now, and, and that's working on, on sovereign risk insurance, and who uh, just prior to last year was working on, on trying to, to put some kind of, of, uh, of um, insurance pool for the same kind of risk. So I just wanted to know if the work of COMESA was linked also to that of the African Union on it and to the um, Africa risk capacity. But if it's a long answer, maybe we can have it offline. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Pierre. I, I, am, I think they are, they are not linked. Uh, this is a, a total independent uh, COMESA initiative uh, together in collaboration with its agencies. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And, All right. and, and this will... Yep. Will only apply once approved. It will only apply for the Comesa member states, not AU. Okay, very good. So it's more regional. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. It was a very interesting uh, session, as as usual. And we do hope that uh, over the course of the year we will continue to have uh, these sessions and to ex expand um, both in terms of the themes and geographically uh, to other island states in the region. Um, but we have plenty that we can discuss of in terms of building back better, or as we now say in the UN, building forward better, uh, and, um, and, and thinking about not just the recovery, but also the, the longer term adaptation of a lot of, of our regional and of the national development plans in the region. So thank you very much uh, to the presenters and to everyone else who was an attendee. Please do not hesitate to come back with questions in writing about um, anything that you may have missed for to, from today that you'd like to ask uh, the, the presenters and we'll be glad to put everyone in touch uh, with one another. The recording, the um, um, presentation will be made available on our dedicated website, a website which we'll be working on uh, to continue improving this year. So thank you again, everyone. I think okay. uh, we can now close the, the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes.
Bye. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.